So the next step after we've got our corrected SN diagram to look at the lifetime of a fatigued part is to consider a non-zero mean stress. There are many cases in which we are going to have a zero mean stress or what we would call fully reversed stresses here, like, like what we've got drawn here, where they reverse about the axis and you've got just as much in compression as you do in tension. And that's where the SN diagram data comes from. So it's going to be very comparable to that situation. But very often we have a mean stress that is elevated above zero and therefore we have to kind of derate the alternating stress that we can design for. So what we see here is kind of the typical example of how we would design a system for a fully reversed fatigue in, in high cycle fatigue. So we have our initial data from the material that we start with SM, we get an SE prime based simply on the material data, then based on the loading situation and the, the type of material we're going to use, type of surface finish, etc., we then kind of derate that alternating stress at the fatigue, or sorry, the endurance limit here, and then we draw this new line and then calculate based on the number of desired cycles what the allowable alternating stress would be to cause failure there which would be de facto a factor of safety of one and then we would design for factor of safety by dividing this number say we had a factor of safety of three then we would design for one third of that alternating stress so we have this way to calculate the factor of safety here that we came up with in the last slide presentation that the factor of safety is the uh, number of uh, sorry the alternating stress at the desired number of cycles divided by the design alternating stress. And this is only valid, again, for fully reversed stresses. So if we want to account for a non-zero mean stress, where we don't have this perfect situation that we would have in the lab doing tests to get this data, then we need to change our procedure. So generally what we do is we go through the first set of steps. We still select our material, calculate our SN diagram, use our correction factors, and we have to kind of guess at our first iteration. The better that guess is, the fewer times we're going to have to iterate, the quicker we're going to get to a solution. But we calculate our corrected endurance strength, we draw our SN diagram, and then calculate the alternating stress for the desired life with a factor of safety of one. In other words, the alternating stress on that curve. Then, we need to determine the relationship between the alternating and mean stresses. Sometimes the alternating and mean stress are related. For example, a bicycle pedal. You're either standing on the pedal and putting this full load on it or in the backstroke you're letting go. There's no load on the pedal whatsoever. So generally the mean stress is going to be half of the alternating stress in that case depending on what stress on the pedal you're looking at. But in general we're going to have what we call a repeated stress in that case. So there's this relationship between the alternating and mean stress. There may be other situations where they're totally independent. There may be situations in which one has a lot of variation and the other doesn't. The Goodman diagram, or what we call the modified Goodman diagram, is what we're going to use, is the way that we calculate safety factor with that. It's a little bit more involved than what we've done with the SN diagram so far. So perhaps the best way to go over the Goodman diagram is to go ahead and do a design and walk through how it works and how we use it. So let's say that we have this design case here where we're designing a pin to be put in axial tension. It's diameter D. There are really no design features that we need to mess with. I'd rather just get to straight to the Goodman diagram and then later on you can see how you add stress concentration factors and that type of thing. You add it the same way you would in any normal design problem, fatigue design problem. So let's say we have load P put on this pin and load P varies over time. So because we haven't selected a diameter yet we can't say what the alternating and mean stresses are but we do have an alternating and mean force. And in this case we would say that the load on this is 2540 pounds of load plus or minus 1260 so it's varying 1260 pounds either way so up to about 3800 pounds down to about 1300 pounds so a reasonable way to get an initial estimate at a good design is to select your material pick a shape you know in this case we have picked a cylindrical pin and do a static design that gets you kind of in the neighborhood of a good solution the static design at least makes sure that you're not going to experience yielding at the highest stress which is still a necessity and we'll see that that pops out actually on the Goodman diagram later but not only that we want to give it maybe a fatter factor of safety than we normally would so if we want a factor of safety in the end after we've done our fatigue design of say three then let's go ahead and design for the static case of six 
as we can see here. So if we start off with 6, it's going to put us in some respects a little higher than we we think we might be and in some respects it might put us a little bit lower than we think we might be. So remember that the general mantra for designing a part in a static load is to look at the highest load that we expect and then compare that to the yield strength and then uh, the stress resulting from the highest load that we expect the ratio between that and the yield strength is what we're going to call our factor of safety. So in a normal case we would say that the yield strength over this greatest stress we expect would be our factor of safety. So let's say for right now that we select a 4340 steel, very hardenable. This is not even near its, its most hardened condition, so 125 KSI ultimate tensile strength, 102 KSI yield strength. So we've actually got still a good bit of ductility in the material, which is a good idea. And uh, let's say that we turn this pin on a lathe. Uh, we want a good surface finish off of that lathe, but a typical lathe is capable of a 63 micro inch finish. It's not terribly difficult to attain. And let's say that this is going to run at room temperature and we're going to design for 720,000 cycles. Most of that isn't germane to what we're going to do directly here, but for the rest of the problem, this is the, the setup. So we've just got a kind of a standard pin, 4340 steel hardened about halfway up its range. And, um, normal room temperature kind of real typical application. So if we did a static design, we can simply say, well, the yield strength over the factor safety is going to be equal to the load over the area because this is an axial stress. So we have the following equations. We come off with a diameter that gives us 0.533 inches. So a little over a half an inch. Seems reasonable uh, for, uh, for a 3,800 pound load. So this would be designed to withstand 3,800 pounds, this highest load here, which is quite different, we'll see, from the fatigue case and how we correlate that to a fatigue stress. So let's look at how we do that. So perhaps the easiest way to take a look at the Goodman diagram and how it works is to go ahead and run through a really simple example of a fatigue design that includes it. So let's take our static approximation and run it through fatigue design and check the factor of safety. So just to give you some perspective, generally the way that we approach a fatigue problem is we have to kind of guess and iterate. It's not always the case, but usually the easiest way to get to a solution is to come up with something close that works, like we said we were going to do with our static design here, and then run that static design through the fatigue process, so base the fatigue calculations that we do on this initial static design and then see where we're at. At least get some point of reference. Are we way too big? Are we way too small? Are we somewhere in the ballpark based on the uh, parameters of the problem? So in this case, again, we have this alternating load that is exerted over an area of 0 0.223 square inches. It's assuming that we take this original static design. Remember, our diameter was 0.533 inches. Plug that into our just typical area calculation we get 0.223 square inches so a little less than a quarter of a square inch and our load is 2540 pounds plus or minus 1260 pounds so the mean part of our load is 2540 seen here by the green line and the alternating part is 1260 above and below that mean so from the green to the orange line is 1260 pounds to get that into a stress here we have just a simple uniaxial uni tensile case, so we simply divide P by A, and that gives us a mean stress of, of 11,390 PSI and an alternating stress of 5,650 PSI. What we're going to look at is the interplay of these two variables. First, we're going to go through the SN diagram the way that we typically would for, say, a fully reversed case. In other words, where there's no mean stress. If we had nothing but this alternating stress, if we ignore this mean level of stress, then we could simply compare that to the SN diagram and be done. But the Goodman diagram helps us determine the effect of this elevated mean stress because we've always got this tensile stress on it that's pulling on those micro cracks and trying to get them to open up. Essentially what this amounts to is a faster failure of your part. So if you want to design for a given number of cycles, then you have to reduce the load. So again, we're using 4340 steel. We started off with a six factor safety, a six for our static approximation. Now we're going to be using a factor safety three as we go forward. And uh, we've got our variables as we have previously defined them.
So let's go ahead and draw the SN diagram. Again, this is an axial tensile case. So straight off the bat, SM, our strength at a thousand cycles, we lose 25% of our strength because it's an axial case. This has to do with the fact that we are stressing all the fibers in this part equally, so they're all taking the maximum load, as opposed to bending or torsion, where just the outer shell is taking that maximum load, and the internal parts of the cross-section generally are far less stressed. So in this case, we've got SM is 93.75 KSI, reduced from 125,000 PSI, and we have that the uncorrected endurance strength is 62.5 KSI, or half of 125 KSI. So we've got this uncorrected curve. We're going to go ahead and apply our correction factors and get our actual SN curve as if this was a fully reversed stress case. So again, go through this quickly. It's an axial load, so C load is 0 0.7. So not only do we get a 25% reduction on our initial estimate of SM, we now get a 30% reduction on SE prime. Axial load, so axial loads don't actually use C size. C size becomes a very important variable as you look at either a combined loading case or a, a case using bending or torsion where you're stressing those outer fibers, especially because C size is usually the thing that causes your iterations to become complicated because as you change your parameters, you have to change C size. For an axial case, it's not really the case, and the models that we use for C size really only apply to steel. So we don't have great models for aluminum or cast aluminum to use with the stress life approach. So that type of thing has to be eaten up, either in the understanding in this case that we're reducing the axial load by 30% or the axial strength uh, by 30%. So we're kind of eating that up there. Uh, if you need more of a buffer, then you use a higher factor of safety. That's generally how we address that. So moving on. RA 63 micro inches, so from the standard charge you can take a look at that with an ultimate tensile strength of 125 KSI. This gives us a C surf around 0 0.9 because it's a pretty fine surface finish and a pretty uh, moderate but high ultimate tensile strength. Room temperature, so C temp is 1. And let's shoot for 95% reliability, so 5 failures and 100 underneath the number of cycles that we're designing for, so C reliability is 0 0.868. So if we take 0 0.7, times 0 0.9 times 0 0.868, we calculate our new endurance strength, our corrected endurance strength at 34.2 KSI. And so we get this line here, and we can get the equation for that by doing a little bit of logarithmic math. We get that the equation of that line is sigma A equals 256,963N to the negative 0 0.146. And so from there, we can plug in either SM or SE and check and make sure that those points are correct. And so if we go back to our original static design, we said that we should have a diameter of 0 0.533 inches. And we calculated our alternating and mean stresses based on that before. So if we take a look at our factor of safety now, assuming that this is a fully reversed case, again, ignoring the mean stress. So we're just looking at that alternating portion of the stress. Then we have at 720,000 cycles, our allowable alternating stress, if we had a factor of safety of 1, would be 35,900 PSI. So based on uh, strength of 35,900 PSI, for a factor of safety of 3, we would come up with a diameter of 0.366, so a little less than 3 eighths of an inch. So we were off by, you know, about 25%, which can be significant, especially because diameter is related to the square uh, the square of the diameter is related to the area. So um, so that's a pretty significant difference. In other words, if we look at it another way, with our original diameter of 0 0.533 inches, we come up with a factor of safety of 6.4. So we originally designed for a static factor of safety of 6, and we came up with a factor of safety of 6.4. And you'd say, wait, what's up with that? And we say, well, remember that the mantra that we used when we did our static design was to look at the maximum stress, which was 3,800 pounds, well, induced by a load of 3,800 pounds. So that's the maximum load on the material. The SN diagram only looks at the alternating stress, so it's only looking at that 1,260 pounds back and forth. It doesn't include the mean stress. So you may have a very high load, a load very close to your yield point, and a small alternating stress, and it will not reflect the fact that you ha you're very close to your yield strength. 
that's one of the issues with this, and this is why we introduced the SN diagram, or sorry, the Goodman diagram to correct that. So that's why we find actually a higher factor of safety with this than we found with our original design. So we say, well, how do we take a look at that? Well, we use the Goodman diagram. So the Goodman diagram describes the interplay of mean stress and alternating stress on failure at a given number of cycles. It essentially describes how much weaker our part is in alternating strength based on an elevated mean strength at a given number of cycles. So let's take a look at what I mean. If we draw the Goodman line, by the way, here's the equation. We start here on the alternating stress axis. If we think about the case where the mean stress is zero, then we have exactly the situation described by the SN diagram. So we use our point from the SN diagram, 35.9 KSI in this case and we would have failure at the number of cycles of interest, in this case 720,000 cycles, as shown here. The strength at 720,000 cycles, or whatever number of cycles of interest you're drawing this at, you draw it for a given number of cycles, and you draw the line from there to down on the mean stress axis. If we had no alternating strength, then the stress required to break the part would be 125 KSI. So as the alternating stress goes to zero, of course, we have the static case. Now, we say, well, what about the yield strength? We'll get to that. But let's just look at that from this perspective. At 720,000 cycles, what we're saying is normally we would design, for example, we design for a point down here around 5,000 PSI of alternating stress. Based on that, we calculated our factor of safety by saying, well, we're at 35.9 KSI and we're down here at 5 KSI, so we came up with in the previous slide, I believe, a factor of safety of 6.4. 6.4, wait, our static factor of safety was lower than that. How does that happen? Well, remember that when we looked at the SN diagram, we did not consider mean stress at all. When we looked at the SN diagram, all we considered was the alternating stress. It does not tell you your relative closeness to yield due to the highest stress in the part. All it tells you is the propagation of cracks due to these repeated stresses and your factor safety as far as that is concerned. So, as we normally calculate our factor safety from the SN diagram, we take this length here from 35.9 to 0, and we divide it by the length from our operating point to 0. So in that case, 35.9 over 5,650, well, 35,900 over 5,650, and we came up with 6.4. The point being, that's because our alternating stress was lower than our mean stress. We could, in theory, looking at the SN diagram, we could have a really high mean stress and a very small alternating stress. We might be right up against that yield point, but it wouldn't have any way to tell us. That's what the Goodman diagram is here for, because we can't describe mean stresses with this with the SN diagram because it's, it's not developed in that way. That's not what the data shows and it's not what the data is based on. So this describes how much we need to derate that alternating stress according to how much elevated mean stress we've got in order to maintain a life, a part life of at least, in this case, 720,000 cycles. If you want to design for endurance, then you draw this using your endurance limit. If you want to draw it for 440,000 cycles, then you use your alternating strength at 440,000 cycles to draw the point on the y-axis. So that's the Goodman line. Now, again, we say, well, wait a minute. We always design to avoid yielding because we don't like plastic deformation, especially in parts where I want the dimensions to stay the same and I don't want to do any uh, permanent deformation on my part. I want it to come apart and go back together the same way it did in the first place. So let's draw the yield line. And so the yield line goes from the yield point on the mean stress axis up 45 degrees to the yield point on the alternating stress axis, which is way off the page here. Um, so this defines another part of the envelope that we're, we say, well, we're also going to stay below this. So in other words, if I design for any operating point on this line up to here and then this line down to here, that would theoretically, based on this, give me failure at 720,000 cycles. So if I want to design for 720,000 cycles life, based on the rating factors and based on the SN diagram we had in the previous slide. And I say, well, but I have a mean stress, for example, of 75 KSI. Then if I wanted failure at 720,000 cycles, then I would come over here and design for 14 KSI alternating stress. 
that's what this is that's what this is telling you this is telling you that on this envelope we have a theoretical factor of safety of one now remember the SN diagram itself is based on very noisy data it's notoriously I won't say inconsistent but it is certainly noisy even when you plot it log log you can see the noise all over the place the, the plots that the fits aren't amazing they're, they're not great they work and they're, they're decent but we have to understand that these models are stochastic in nature and there is a lot of variability in them so we have to understand that so this isn't like written in stone or derived from first principles it's not like the second law of thermodynamics you know we this isn't hard and fast and deterministic but we're going to use it as a tool to determine our kind of distance from the envelope so saying that how would we calculate our distance from the envelope so again we originally determined safety factor by the relative distance from here so from the origin to the operating point that would cause failure and the origin to the operating point where we're actually operating so in this case we had an alternating stress of 5650 psi and a mean stress of 11,400 psi so let's go ahead and draw that on the graph so I want to say how close is this point to the envelope and you might say well I don't have enough information there are a bunch of different ways we could measure the closeness to the envelope remember that the function of factor safety is to account for variability and unknowns in the model that we can't otherwise predict so the point of the factor of safety is to give us margin where we're not sure what the behavior is doing so if I have trouble for example predicting the alternating stress maybe I've got a situation where <coughs> excuse me the mean stress is very consistent or very easy to predict but the alternating stress is not one example might be a bolted connection <coughs> where I'm setting that bolt pretension with a device or a, a load indicating bolt or washer and so I've got this bolted connection that is set and I'm not going to change the pretension on that bolt so the pretension on that bolt very well established probably not really going to change over time so I would say in that case that I have a very good idea of the position of this point in X so I'm not worried about variability in this I'm worried about variability in this so I'm not sure say uh, on the about the loads that are going to be exerted on that joint and they're going to be exerted over time so I'm going to get this alternating stress on the bolt over time but it's not going to change the mean pretension of that load well if that's the case then I would draw my envelope like so I would draw it vertically accounting for the variability in the model that I expect so in this case we draw this vertical line and we would calculate the length from the origin to the Goodman line in the vertical fashion and then the length from our operating point to the mean stress axis and divide them and we get a factor of safety of 5.8 holy cow we just had 6.4 from our static uh, assumption then as we got through the SN diagram so we started with a static calculation of six we went through the SN diagram and of course came up with something bigger which you know for a moment didn't make sense but then we thought oh yeah we were just looking at the alternating stress now we are looking at the elevated mean stress and we find wait a minute this is this is still you know Dr. Setters what do you what did you what did you what were you doing telling us to design for a factor of safety of six this is ridiculous this is ridiculous and that may be true but we see that this is 5.8 because our mean stress is so low we're very close to the axis over here so there's not much difference between the 6.4 that we just came up with and the 5.8 that we're coming up with now but it's calculated in much the same way because in this case we're not talking about any variability in the mean stress so now I might say well what if the mean stress and the alternating stress are related and by that I mean if I increase the alternating stress it's going to bring the mean stress up with it one example of this would be a bicycle pedal as I step on that pedal I'm going from zero to full load and then in the second half of that pedal stroke I let go of the pedal so it goes back to zero every time this is an example of something we would call a repeated load and so if I look at that variability over time if I increase the force that I put on the pedal that's going to increase my alternating stress it's also going to increase my mean stress because it's repeated the mean stress will always be half of well it will be always be equal to the alternating stress or half of the full wave so in that case we would have an alternating stress and mean stress that are equal in this case we had an operating point we know that the we had this uh, force wave 
that was centered at 2540 with an alternating uh, force of 1260 pounds. So if we say, well, I'm not sure exactly what the model here is. So maybe there's a small mean stress even when the alternating stress is zero, or maybe there's a big mean stress when the alternating stress is zero. Let's assume for a moment that the alternating stress and mean stress are linearly related. In other, wise, in other words, they go at zero alternating stress, there is zero mean stress. And at our operating point, we know that we had 1,260 pounds of alternating force with 2,540 pounds of mean force. So we would then draw the line through it from the origin. And so this line might go through the origin, this line might go through a fixed point on the mean stress axis, it might go through a fixed point on the alternating stress axis. But when you have a relationship between the two, you can then draw that line. So in this particular case, we would say, well, if we assumed that the mean stress and alternating stress were related according to the ratio, just from 0 to 1260, 0 to 2540, and calculate the slope of this line, then we would find that the length from the origin, again, to the intersection of the Goodman line here, 51,200 psi, which is the length of that line, over 12,700 psi, which is the length of this line, we get a factor of safety of four, slightly lower. So now we're saying, wait a second, just because of the relationship between these two, even if I have variability in one because the two are related, I will automatically have variability in the other, and that brings me closer to my envelope in relative form. So, you know, the, the, the relative closeness is different for that situation. So you have to kind of weigh the situation in realistic thinking. What is governing the design that's in front of me? Is this something where I expect variability in the mean stress? Or is it a case where I really don't know? I don't know, but I know that there's alternating stress and mean stress and they're somehow related. Then this would be a more conservative model. A third way to think about it would be, okay, what if I've got this alternating stress that is almost perfectly predictable, just really, really easy to predict, or I know it really well, I know a lot about it, it's very easy to predict, but the mean stress, man, I, I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like, so I don't have a good idea of what that mean stress could be, you know, it might change from day to day, we get some variability in it, or I don't uh, have really good information about exactly where it's set, so, you know, somebody's going to tighten that bolt with a torque wrench, and I, I'm not sure exactly uh, how tight it's going to be from the get-go, because we don't have a really good measurement for that, but we know the loads that are going to be put on that bolted joint really well. Well, in that case, then I need to account for variability in the horizontal direction. And so I do that like this. So if I were to do it this way, oh my goodness, we go all the way over to the yield line, and we get a factor of safety 8.5. Wait, what? Now remember, we're looking now at the mean stress, the level of mean stress, where before in our static design, there, there's still a big fundamental difference here. In our static design, we looked at the maximum overall stress. In this case, we're saying, well, we've got this alternating mean stress combination, and it's 720,000 cycles. Actually, it, the yield line, if you wind up intersecting the yield line, of course, that's irrespective of the number of cycles. But we would say our factor of safety in this case, if we know the alternating stress really well, would be 8.5. Now, the most conservative case, you know, say I don't really know anything about the mean stress, I don't really know anything about the alternating stress. They may or may not be related, I don't know, I don't understand that relationship, I really don't know a whole lot about it, but I have a way of at least predicting this is what I think the mean stress is going to be in this, and this is what I think the alternating stress is going to be. So maybe I want to account for variability in the model variability and all sorts of stuff that I don't understand with respect to where that mean stress is going to be on the envelope, where the alternating stress is going to be on the envelope, then the more conservative way to do that will be to look at the distance from zero stress whatsoever to our operating point, and then the minimum distance from our operating point to the Goodman line. That should give us the lowest factor of safety that we expect out of this situation. So if this is my loading point, and then based on the number of cycles I'm designing for, this is my modified Goodman line, this envelope here, then the minimum factor of safety I would come up with here would be this plus this over this. So in this case, 12,700 PSI plus 25,900 PSI over 12,700 PSI gives me three. How about that? Holy cow, what we were originally shooting for. So in this case, 
You can find this line, by the way, very easily because you know the slope of the Goodman line. That's given to you straight away. And you know, of course, from algebra so many years ago, I'm sure you remember that the slope of an intersecting line that intersects, or sorry, the slope of a perpendicular line is going to be the negative reciprocal of the slope of the line that you intend to cross. And then you simply plug in your operating point and solve y equals mx plus v. And you get, you already have m, and so you get b based on y and x, and you're good to go. So pretty easy. All of this is rudimentary math, but what this is describing again is kind of this worst case where we have a uh, distance from zero to our operating point and then the minimum distance from here to the envelope. The worst case would be that we intersect the envelope along that line. So r regardless of the relationship between mean stress and alternating stress, whatever that looks like, um, this would give us the most conservative approach according to kind of common usage of the modified Gibbon line. Now, be aware, there are a number of different curves out there. There's a parabola, there are some ellipses. There are different ways of describing this failure envelope depending on what you're doing. If you're doing shaft design, there's actually uh, an ASME elliptic uh, shaft design. And, uh, there are all sorts of different ways to, to demonstrate or to describe the relationship between alternating stress and mean stress. This is probably one of the most simple models and it's also pretty widely used. It's conservative. It's, it's not the most conservative, but it's decently conservative. Again, as long as you're using these tools with the understanding that there is variability in these models, and that's what a factor of safety is for, and you're being reasonable with your selection thereof, and you're using good information, you should be just fine. But there is variability in these models, and we have to deal with that. So that's what the Goodman line does. That's what the Goodman diagram does. So in this case, depending on how we calculate that factor of safety, we come up with anything from 8.5 to 3.0. And so this gives us a much better understanding, I hope, of what designing for a given number of cycles tells us. The way that we can extend this in the future, as you develop your skills with this and get better at using it, is instead of simply selecting a part size and going through this first iteration and saying, well, here's my operating point, and here's my envelope, and here's what it is, and so, you know, kind of this guess and check and guess and check, which can be very lengthy. Eventually, it's good to get to the point where you make one guess, you check, and then you say, okay, based on that, now I've got my Goodman diagram. I have a good s idea where I'm at. You know, I've got C size, and i got an idea where that's at because I've got bending or torsion or whatever that is. You know, we don't have that in this case because it's an axial load. But then taking a look at that objectively and saying, well, here's my envelope. Where do I want to be? Based on the factor of safety that I want and based on the relationships that I expect to be in play here, where do I want to be? And then you look at that point and you say, okay, how do I design a part to give me that operating point based on the loads I've got? That is a much more powerful understanding and a much more powerful usage for this tool that requires an understanding of how it works, that you can back out some of that math. But none of this is beyond you. You're perfectly capable of this. This is nothing more than some algebra and understanding logarithms and being able to read graphs. So I hope this tool is useful, and it's essential for understanding and using design tools in real-world fatigue problems.